Um, my name is Lashima Barr. My background is in biology. With that degree, I've had an opportunity to do a couple of things. I've worked as a middle school science teacher for a couple of years in North Carolina. I also worked as a laboratory scientist. Um, my most recent roles have been with Educate Tomorrow's Parents, which is a nonprofit organization in Raleigh aimed at preventing child abuse. And we talk to teens about how to prepare for their families so that we can reduce incidents of child abuse later in life. I've also had the opportunity to work with a child abuse prevention agency called Safe Child, which stands for Stop Abuse for Every Child. Um, anyone can experience abuse. Um, if we think about some of the numbers and the data we see nationally, there are millions of reports each year of child, different types of child abuse, and that can range from physical abuse, emotional abuse, or sexual abuse, or it can be ne neglect as well. And oftentimes, kids and teens, or you know, people can feel like they're the only one. But when we look at the numbers, there's a lot of people, a lot of children experience abuse. When we think about who the perpetrators are often in um, physical abuse, it's 75% of the time it's the parent. And then we have cases where it's, you know, sexual abuse may not be a parent, but 90 over 90% of the time it's someone that the child or family knows. And so unfortunately, it's often those people who care the most or closest to the children who um, perpetrate abuse. So there are a couple of reasons. Um, we can break those down. Sometimes it's knowledge, attitudes, and just behavior. So when we talk about knowledge, we can think about sometimes people just tend to do what they know to do. They may not understand a child's needs or where they are developmentally. So sometimes they have, may have unreasonable expectations and that can cause a parent to be frustrated and um, to harm a child unintentionally. Um, and then sometimes it's, you know, adult attitudes. If we have a child who's a playful kid and they may, you know, give you a little bit of back talk, sometimes we take children's behaviors personally. And it's like, oh, well, they're just not listening to me. When really children do silly things all the time and they, you know, are growing and learning. So they may not always behave in ways that are appropriate. And sometimes it's just our own behaviors. If Adults are sometimes, you know, were abused as a child. That's all they know. They may not necessarily attend it to abuse, but it's what they thought was the best method at the time. So wanting to teach a child a lesson wasn't the bad thing, was the method that they chose in that moment, because that was the information and knowledge available to them. That knowledge, attitudes, and behavior really can cut across any type of relationship. Um, if I have a peer-to-peer -peer relationship, my attitude about um, what's appropriate for other people's behavior will play into how I respond to them. My um, behaviors and my experiences play into how I interact with people. So those same principles that I just spoke about really plays into any type of relationship. The question could be whose fault is it that we didn't know enough, you know, or that we weren't able to handle our stress enough? So don't typically use the word fault as in, as opposed to thinking about reasons why it happens because parenting is tough. Um, caring for children is tough. Um, and in those situations, like I said, because most of the time it is the parent, then it's often because they don't know a better way. They got frustrated, they lashed out, it, you know, um, and caused harm. When we think about, um, caring for children and being a responsible adult, it's one of the few things that you can do without a certification, right? But when you think about it, the numbers of where the abuse is occurring, there's no, there's no test to say, all right, you're gonna be a good parent, you get to have this kid. And oftentimes there's, there's not a lot of, some people are in a situation where they're fortunate enough to look and read best practices and learn before they become a caregiver, but oftentimes they don't. And so that's why education is so important. Education can lead to a change in attitude, a change in knowledge, and a definite change in behavior. And so even if you don't have children of your own and you're not ready for your family yet, you may have family members. You may have maybe a babysitter. You may have young cousins or uh, younger brothers and sisters. When you learn, you can actually um, be helpful in that way. Most of us never, we think, well, we will harm children, you know? And so knowing those different strategies can be helpful. One thing that comes to mind, especially as a teen, where that's a stage of life where you're kind of choosing the people you want to be in relationship with, whether it's friendships, um, romantic relationships, individuals you're interested in, um, you want to get to know more. 
At ETP, Educate Tomorrow's Parents, we talk about often how important it is to choose wisely the people that are a part of our lives. Um, you want to choose people who are a positive influence in your life. You want to choose people who um, support your dreams and goals because those types of people are not going to be, to be the people to hurt you because abuse can happen from one teen to another, that can happen. So it's important to choose people who support your dreams and goals, who are gonna be a positive influence, um, who know what you want and are gonna push you towards that. 